Welcome back everyone as we continue our Receive Power series. Today we're going to be talking about power over addiction and I'd like to start today with a story about Cindy. Cindy was nine years old when she joined a gang and her neighborhood had two gangs in the neighborhood and even as a young child it really was not safe to go outside. So the only way you could really walk the streets and relatives safely was to join one gang to protect you from the other gang. And so that's exactly what she did. Now gangs tend to uh, treat you like family, but they don't exactly have the family values that uh, most families would like to instill within their children. So as a young adolescent, Cindy had already faced many things that many parents pray that their children never have to face. So as part of a coping mechanism, and also as part of the expectation of the gang, uh, she turned to substance abuse. And by the age of 11 years old, Cindy was addicted to drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes. Fast forward to the age of 35, and Cindy was free from the gang, but she wasn't free from the pain that, that resulted from years of neglect and abuse. Her addictions were as strong as ever. She tried to drown out her pain and it seemed like her only means of escape. I quote her when I say years of searching for a way out left her broken and bewildered. And one day while she was painting an apartment and drinking at the same time, uh, with no other way out, she finally decided that her only answer was suicide. And so while she's painting, she's planning her own death. And even worse is she was carefully planning how to take her four children with her. She had gone through so much pain in her life that she couldn't bear to see her children go through the same thing. And so she felt the best way to protect them was to take them with her. Such a sad story. Addictions can destroy families. They can destroy lives. They can seem impossible to break. That's the term addiction. And uh, the body just craves to be fed. Whatever you're addicted to, the body just will not let go. And, and it, it wants it so strongly that you just you feel like you have no control over it. And you have to give in. Uh, let me tell you today, there is hope. Now, some refuse to admit that they have an addiction problem. And others are happy in their addiction and they really have no desire to change. They might say they want to change, they might say they don't want the negative effects of the addiction, but they really have no interest in changing their lifestyle. And really, un until they're willing to move beyond that, uh, they're going to stay in their addiction. But I'm here to tell you today that those that truly want to break free of addiction, there is hope. There is hope. And it starts by getting the Holy Ghost, by pursuing a relationship with God. Having the power of the Holy Ghost in your life will do amazing things for you. And they will, God will help you with your addiction as he fills you with his power. Now, some are miraculously delivered. They receive the Holy Ghost and their addiction is gone. Others hardly have to try. They put a little bit of effort into it, and God blesses them. Their addiction is gone. And yet still others, even with the Holy Ghost, they still struggle, and they have to fight their way through it. But eventually, if they're serious about their relationship with God, and they're serious about their addiction, they eventually win freedom over it. Now, we have no idea why God delivers some completely, and why some have to struggle quite a bit to get through it. But I do know that God is there with you. God will help you. He will break that bondage in your life. For some reason, he takes it away from everybody. And other people, he expects them to uh, work on it. Uh, but I can promise you that if God is allowing you to work your way through that addiction, that there's a reason behind it. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you a better person. Whatever it is, there is a reason behind it. And so the first thing we need to do as we face our addictions is to admit 
that we have a problem. You got to do it to yourself first and then to others. There's something about humbling oneself and admitting to other people, confessing to them that you are addicted to something that allows the healing process to start. I don't know exactly why that is or how it works, but it's probably something like having a festering wound that's just not being taken care of. And the only way that wound can start to heal is if you get that wound out in the open so you can clean it, so you can get the help that you need, so you can patch it up so that wound can start to heal. If the wound is ignored, if the wound is hidden, it's likely to just fester and get worse and worse and worse. And so we need to confess. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I didn't say it's going to be easy. It might be really hard even to confess, especially if it's a hidden addiction, if it's a hidden sin that nobody else knows about, and now you have to step out and share something that you might be ashamed of. It's going to be hard, but the first step is stepping out. Admit to yourself you have a problem. Understand that you cannot solve this problem on your own. Admit to God that you have a problem and admit to others. Confess to God first and then others. Now you need to use wisdom. You don't just go running around, hey everybody, I've got a problem and I need help getting it fixed. You got to use wisdom. Get guidance as to how far reaching your confession even should go and who you even talk to. But generally, those that you've affected by your addiction, the people that you have hurt, the people that are close to you, you need to talk to them. And you also need to talk to those that can help you. Those two groups of people at a minimum. Now, it may not be able to happen right away. Um, some people, even though they're close to you and that you've hurt, uh, you might have to go into it slowly. You might have to take your time. Uh, you need to seek good guidance on who you should talk to and how far you should take that conversation. But start by finding people that you can start opening up and sharing your heart with. It's so important, so very important. Secondly, you need to seek forgiveness. You need to be truly repentant about sinning against God and about hurting others. Depending on how strained that relationship is, this might come immediately or it may have to be done in steps. But in most situations, it is very important that this is eventually addressed. Matthew 5, 23, 24, I'm reading from the CEV version. If you are about to place your gift on the altar, in other words, you go to God, you're bringing something to the Lord, and you remember that someone is angry with you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, make peace with that person, then come back and offer your gift to God. It's important that we address the relational issues in our lives, especially when we have affected those relationships as a result of our addiction. Okay, so now that we've admitted the problem, we've repented to people, we've confessed, now we gotta get that help. Many people try and try and try again to conquer their addictions on their own. It, I wanna say it never works. It probably does once in a blue moon, but it likely isn't going to work for you. It just doesn't work. You've got to get help. We need that support. We need that encouragement. We need the help to get through this challenge in our lives. And secondly, we need accountability. We need someone that we can trust to sh open our hearts and share some things, some things that may be even really deep, really personal. We need at least one person in our lives that we can share that with and they can hold us accountable to start doing what's right, to be there for us when we need them. We need that. We need that. We need people that will faithfully work with us and as often as necessary. That's so important. And that's why I want to go now into the body of Christ. When you receive the Holy Ghost, 
you become a part of the body of Christ. You can read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now you can look at this in a macro view or a micro view. A macro view is when you receive the Holy Ghost, you're now a part of the body of Christ with everybody else who has the Holy Ghost in their lives. We are one big, huge, corporate, worldwide body. But you can also look at it in the micro view in your local church. Each local church is kind of a body within the body as um, we work together as a team, as a group, as a body to not only encourage and strengthen one another, but to help God's work spread as we spread the good news, we spread the gospel. So I say all this to say we're here for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. See, the body, a bunch, this group of individuals, we're all different. God has blessed us with different gifts, and we are here to support one another. And so there are people in your church that can help you. There are people in the body of Christ that can help you. Go work with your pastor and find them. Now, if you send, attend a smaller church, there might not be just the right people there to help you. Or if you have something that's very specific and needs a, a, a certain type of person, maybe that person's not available in the, in the micro view. But you can get help from the body of Christ. We do not need to turn to this world for help. We do not. Now, I'm not saying anything against professional counseling and stuff. But what I am saying is there are people in the church and the body of Christ that can help us. Now, if we need medical assistance, that's different, obviously, but they're not offering us any um, spiritual or counseling type guidance. They're offering physical help for our body as we go through certain situations. So I'm definitely not saying that you would never uh, go to that. But when, when we go to help for, for emotional, for mental, for spiritual assistance, we have to stay in the body of Christ. You have no idea what's out there. You have no idea the way people are thinking and they're unbiblical thinking and they might look good on paper. They might, they might look like the perfect person, but they might hurt you more than they can help you in the long run. And so stick with the body of Christ. Stick with people in the body that know people that can help you. It, we just have to be careful in situations like this. The world today wants to uh, preach to you that an addiction isn't an addiction. It's a disease, and it's really not your fault. An addiction is something that you chose to get yourself into, and you choose to stay into it. Your body might be screaming for it, but you're making the decision to continue in it. It is not a disease. Don't be looking for an excuse to stay in it. You need to admit and get the help from people that understand that we got to break free of this addiction. We got to change our lives. And the body of Christ will help us do that. Other people may, other people may not. So we have to be very careful. If we do go outside the body of Christ, it's because someone in the body knows that person well enough to know that they can help you. And so now that you have the team, now that you have the who, you have to be intentional about the how. You cannot just want to change. You have to commit to change by taking action. So you need to work with the team that you have put together, the people that are willing to help you to come up with various strategies. But the first thing starts with a mental commitment. You have to, in your mind, say, I am not going there. Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with mine eyes why then should I think upon a maid? Here's a man that says, I am not going to struggle with lust because I'm not going to look at a woman. I'm going to keep my blinders on. I'm going to focus on God. And if I have eyes for anyone, it's my wife. You commit yourself to not focusing on whatever the addiction is in your life. Now that it's going to be very difficult because addictions fight your mind. That's where they get you as they start in your mind. So what do we need to do? One of the best things to help keep our minds off of our addiction is to focus on something else. Colossians 3.2 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. Focus on your relationship with God. Bible reading, 
meditating on God's word, praying, seek God's face, get, get on fire for God. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble myself and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Get your mind focused on God rather than on the things that you're addicted to. Create a plan to avoid temptation in the first place. This also helps keep your mind off your addiction. So what do you mean by that? So some examples. You struggle with pornography or things that you can see or view or read on the internet. Well, then you need to get an internet filter and that'll, that keeps you from going to those places. Well, maybe you say, you know what, I've tried filters and they just don't work. When I'm struggling, I can work my way around them and uh, I end up back where I've always been. Well, then get rid of the internet in your home. Set yourself up so the only place you can get on the internet is in public places where other people can see what you are viewing so you don't go there because people are watching you. Um, and if that's not possible, I mean, some people, well, they'll watch just about anything in front of everybody. And so maybe that don't work. Well, let me tell you something. You can live without the internet. You might say it's impossible. It might be impossible with the job you have. Maybe you gotta get a different job, but if that's what it takes, is your soul and your freedom worth it? And so if it comes down to it, maybe you just need to get rid of the internet completely from your life. Uh, take the steps that you need to take to clear the opportunity of temptation and falling into that. Make your home a safe place. A recovering alcoholic does not have beer in the cupboard for for cooking purposes. Uh, they do not keep wine at home and to settle your stomach in case you're not feeling good. You just don't do that. Why? Because you're placing the temptation there. You might have had uh, good intentions, but sooner or later you're going to fall into temptation and you're going to empty that bottle. Deuteronomy 7.26 says, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house lest thou be a cursed thing like it. You bring it into your home and it's going to curse you and you're going to end up being just like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it. You need to hate the thing that's that you're addicted to, that you're under bondage other. And you need to, it says, thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Another example, the friends we have, the places we go. You, If your friends like to go places and do things, that are part of your addiction that you struggle with, you're gonna to have to make some new friends. You might have to say, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't go there with you. We can hang out here, but we can't hang out there. And really, it's probably better that you make new friends. You need to find friends in your lives that are not going to potentially lead you into temptation. You gotta commit yourself to avoiding the temptation in the first place. Don't fool yourself with a lie that you can handle it oh, we're just going to go to this bar and I can drink water and we'll have a good time together. No, it doesn't work. It does not work. You can't go in the middle of your temptation and expect it to be strong enough to handle it. you got to stay away from it. And if that requires making different friends, then it's time to make different friends. Being in proximity to what you are addicted to is extremely dangerous. Another thing to consider is in your emotional state. When you get angry, when you get stressed out, when you get frustrated, when you get depressed, all these different things, they are going to push you toward your addiction. Your mind is going to justify and say, you know, it's been such a lousy day. I deserve this release. I deserve to, to just give in this one time. Or you'll just be upset enough you simply don't care. You just don't care. It's going to happen. So you need to have a plan for when it happens, what are you going to do? Well, what does the Bible tell us to do? The Bible says to flee temptation. So up to this point, we've been just talking about means of minimizing the opportunity of being tempted. 
But what do we do when we're in the middle of that temptation and we're ready to give in? The Bible says flee it. It tells us temptation's going to come. But 2 Timothy 2.22 says flee youthful, youthful lust. Excuse me. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Remember once again, addiction is generally a mind struggle. So we need to strategize to help refocus our mind. And one good way of doing that is to have God's word in our heart and on our mind that specifically relates to our challenge or specifically relates to God and temptation and how powerful he is and, and how we have power over hell and we can have power over our flesh. We need to find verses that speak to us in our addiction. Apply them to memory. So when that temptation is there, the best thing we can do is call on God and start quoting scripture. Quote it out loud if you have to. Uh, some examples, just in general. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. You can say, devil, I resist you in the name of Jesus Christ. I am not going to give in to this temptation as you call upon the name of the Lord and resist the powers of hell. Resist your own flesh. And it is amazing what that will do as a spirit of God wells up in you and gives you power to walk away from that temptation. Uh, if you struggle with drugs, 1 Corinthians 3.17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And when I take things into my body that's destroying my body, I'm destroying God's temple. And I need to remind myself that and say, Lord, I am not going to allow this temple to be destroyed by what I put into it. I am committed to you and allowing the word of God to inspire you and give you strength. Proverbs 20 verse 1, if you struggle with alcohol, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Remind yourself when I give into this, my wisdom is lacking. I'm blowing it. And wise people are going to stay away from this thing because it controls me and it will destroy me. Pornography, Psalms 101 point, uh, point three, 101 verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. We need to find the scriptures that we can relate to that inspire us, commit them to memory. And when we're struggling, we got to pull those scriptures out. We got to start quoting them. Speak them out loud. Shut them out if you need to. Don't be embarrassed. Just do what's necessary. Do what's necessary to get God's word in your heart and your mind and start building that up. Another thing to do is think about those that you hurt when you are in your addiction. Don't let your mind trick you into thinking this one time won't matter. Addictions hurt those around you and start focusing on that. I, I can convince myself that, oh, this one drink or, or this, this one shot or whatever it is, it's no big deal. But it is a big deal because that one turns into another one and turns into another one. And pretty soon your family is in the same situation that they were in before. Pretty soon your loved ones are in the same situation you were before. Pretty soon your co-workers are struggling with the same uh, relational problems that you were in before. Think about the people that you hurt and, and focus on that so that it can encourage you to, I cannot go here because of how I hurt people when I'm wallowing in this addiction. And so allow that, focus on that. Finally, just do something. When you're struggling, find something to do. Focus on a task, preferably with people that you would never give into your addiction in front of. Uh, it's been said forever, some people even attribute to a biblical statement that idle hands are the devil's workshop. And uh, not necessarily in the scripture, there is a verse in one translation that pretty much says that. But uh, it's true. When we're not busy doing something, we tend to find ourselves tempted to, to fall into things we shouldn't fall into. 
And so if you're beginning tempted, find something to occupy your time. Don't expect ideas to jump out at you. Plan ahead. When I start struggling with addiction, I'm going to do this. Now you gotta be wise in your choices. You gotta have good, good things to dive into. Don't allow the very thing that's trying to pull you away from your addiction turn into an addiction itself. But have things ready to do. Have a plan that will help pull your mind off that addiction. Basically, you are fleeing that addiction. You're quoting scripture. You're, you're thinking about other things like who you hurt when you give into addiction. And you're getting your mind focused on other things as you just get busy doing something that has nothing to do with that addiction. Flee. You have to intentionally take action and flee from that addiction. Have a list of people. And when you're going through your struggle, you need to call them. Don't wait till after it's too late. Don't feel like you're going to interrupt their life. Don't be ashamed of the fact that you're going through a challenge. You need to call them when you need them most. If you try to cope yourself, you're almost guaranteed to give in. Yes, sometimes you're going to do it. You're going to be able to handle it on your own, but sooner or later you're going to give in. When you're struggling, call someone. Don't feel like you're being a burden. Get the help and encouragement you need. And finally, when you mess up, when you fall back into that temptation, don't feel like you've totally blown it and don't let it destroy you. You got to get back up and you got to keep going. Repent, uh, confess, let people know you blew it. Uh, your accountability partner, not just everybody, but um, whoever you're working closely with, you got to let them know I blew it so they can be on top of it with you even more to help you and, and encourage you and, and to help you make right decisions. Uh, don't hide it, but get back up on your feet and keep going. If you fail to confess it, you're going to fall back into your addiction. Don't start hiding it now that you uh, we're brave enough to open up and share and, and find people to help take advantage of that help. So, in summary, how do you get power over addiction? I can't express enough your relationship with God and having the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Then you need to confess your addiction to those you have hurt and to those that can help. Uh, confess and seek forgiveness. Um, start creating that healing path in relationships and finding people that can help you through this. Be intentional. Have a plan. Remove sources of temptation from your life. Pursue your relationship with God. Do something. Keep your mind active on other things. Flee that temptation. Uh, through the various methods we talked about, quoting scripture, thinking about other things, who who have you hurt, uh, what kind of projects can you jump into, and finally, don't give up. Now, one thing we haven't talked to up to this point is the reason you may have an addiction. Often addictions are a coping mechanism for a deeper problem. Is there a root cause? Is there a source of your addiction that's driving you to that? You might say, what are you talking about, Brett? Well, some people turn to the bottle and drink because of the stress in their life. Some people turn to drugs because of the pain, uh, such as our opening story with Cindy. The pain in her life just she kept turning to substance abuse to help hide that pain and cover the pain. Some people, you can have addiction to shopping. Some people just may struggle with low self-esteem and feel like they're worthless. And by spending money and, and buying things, it helps you feel like you're accomplishing something and, and makes you feel better about yourself. The source of the problem isn't the shopping. The source of the problem is your low self-esteem. And so you need to examine your heart. You need to examine your life and say, is there something in my life that's driving me to this addiction? Because you can't fix the addiction if you don't first fix the source of that addiction. 
And so the people that you have in your life that can help, that are trying to help you with your addiction can also help you not only pinpoint your, the source of your addiction, but help you or help you get the help with that source. So you need to treat the source to fix the symptom and your support team can help you with both. I want to come back to our opening story, Cindy. I'm so blessed to say that um, that very day that she was putting the final touches on her suicide, the apartment that she was painting, the woman that was going to rent that apartment out once the painting was done, just swung in to see how it was going. And there was something in her spirit that drew Cindy to her. And pretty soon they got to talking about God. And by the time that woman left that day, they'd agreed to do a Bible study together. Cindy received the Holy Ghost, was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And the power of the Holy Ghost radically transformed her life. So much that four months went by before it suddenly dawned on her that she had been miraculously healed of her addictions. Once again, to quote Cindy, she said, Jesus was the peace that I had been so desperate to find. Allow the power of the Holy Ghost to transform your life today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.